Well, it's another Kim video where I'm outside, and once again I'm at the Centre for Computing History in Cambridge. It may have been a fairly miserable bonfire night weekend, but there was a lot going on inside the museum. Specifically, the Retro Computer Festival. It's the first time this event's run at full capacity since 2019, and the variety of exhibits is really something. The loveliest and most dedicated CompuBuffs coming together and bringing the goods. So let's go through some of these wonderful exhibits. I can assure you there is more here than just some exotic and elongated ways of playing Space Invaders, although we will be seeing that game somewhere it really shouldn't be later on, as it happens. Anyway, let us begin. First off, here's some lovely demo footage. What could possibly be producing such loveliness? Well, it could only be an Atari Falcon. It's always great to see one of these in the flesh. Atari's final computer is a belter for 1992 that never managed to get the success it deserved, but one look at these demos just shows what it's capable of. It could also be heard a lot at the event, playing the sort of track music that even relatively modern PCs would struggle with processing live like this does. Nice to see beautiful examples of the Memotech MTX 512 and Sinclair QL here too. I've especially always loved the Memotech's design, it's another computer that deserved a lot more. Here we have Devilish Designs section, and we've got some beautifully preserved early examples of computing, such as the big boxy SWTPC 6800. Those boards have a lot of history too. A fleeting glimpse of the Bywood Scrumpy, the first UK made home computer kit from 1976 and something with a great story that I would love to cover. We've also got two examples of the late great Chuck Peddle's Kim One, also from 1976. The thing that really sticks out here, however, is in this box, a Mark 8 microcomputer. This kit dates all the way back to 1974, and it was actually printed in Radio Electronics and sold a few months before the more famous Altair 8800. Only a few hundred kits were ever sold, a small fraction of those were built, and when it comes to examples that still exist, particularly as well preserved as this one, well those are rarer than a hen's golden tooth. Quite the amazing thing to see here in Cambridge. I must admit, I had concerns because I'd never <laughs> seen anything on the way to go before. Yeah. Next we're looking at something that's very satisfying, a couple of classic Hewlett Packard plotters. I have to say I do find these machines very satisfying to look at in action, particularly the one that's moving the paper about all over the place and doing a fine job of drawing a space shuttle. The one that's moving the paper about is a lot faster than the one that's moving a pen, easily able to overtake it despite the first plotter having a couple of minutes head start. Lovely stuff. A lot of this stuff's been thrown away, but, uh, but even Tom Jewell organises this, even he's got one of these. Yeah. He's just got himself one of these. Oh wow. His mate's got one of these. Yeah. One of the advantages. Almost and speaking of satisfying, how about a Model 33 teletype that dates back to 1963? Let's listen in. You heard this a lot over the weekend, and once again, it's a sound that hocks back to a different time. Here's a pair of nice exhibits. First we have Pete, and some computers from folks who are more famous for consoles. The Sega SK1100 here is a keyboard that connects up to the SG1000 and essentially makes it a home computer, complete with a version of BASIC that was created specifically for it, and a port to add on an SR1000 cassette recorder that turns the SG1000 into an SC3000. Much the same applies to a Famicom that's got an HVC007 keyboard hooked up to it, allowing the user to run the family basic cartridge. Of all games, this setup was one in the infamous Samari for most of the weekend. It's Sonic, only with Mario, on the Famicom. And yet, yeah, it's bad. But it does make for a nice segue to Here Be Dragon's Wares, a mixture of real machines and clones. 
You've seen two Matra Alices that look identical, but one's a horrible cheap clone that holds one measly kilobyte of memory. Not exactly good for 1983. This CP400 here is a Brazilian clone of the Tandy Coco, also quite cheap and cheerful although not that bad. Next to it we have two quite well known machines, the original Silver Coco and the Dragon 32. Now the Dragon is often called a clone of the Coco which isn't necessarily accurate, they're more like cousins and the Dragon was far more successful over here. Tony told me about Tandy's arrogance when it came to selling the Coco in the UK. They tried to sell it for £399, the same price as it sold for in the US but without any conversion. The Dragon 32 was sold for half of that price and is just about the same machine. It's also better looking and has a far superior keyboard. Needless to say, the Coco failed miserably in the UK as a result. It's not all bad here for Tandy mind you. This Video Genie system here is a lovely clone of the TRS-80 from Hong Kong, one that's very nicely built indeed complete with a bit of wood action and it's one in the very impressive TRS-80 version of Zaxxon. Not bad at all for a computer that goes all the way back to 1977. Far less impressive is this version of Breakout which I have to say is probably the worst one I've ever played. I mean, the bulb goes through your paddle half of the time. Yuck. Still, this housed from a very impressive collection of Casio machines, courtesy of the Computer Museum's Adrian. You've got the PV7, the PV2000, plenty more besides that, as well as the PV16. This one here also has an add-on that essentially turns the computer into an MSX compatible machine. A very basic one indeed, but it is at least capable of running Alien 8. The Casio computers aren't exactly the greatest micros ever made, putting it mildly, but then this festival is hardly about showing off the best and the brightest comps that everyone knows, is it? It's about rejoicing in the obscure also rans, the machines that were before their time and the ones that failed for pretty good reasons. They're all here in one place and so much more besides. Oh, it goes over the top. Um, Customer back in its time. Uh, they were about, I believe, about the equivalent of about £130. So, oh, there we go. Hey, there's only an So, um. All the, all the manufacturers, despite it being in a similar standard, they all went very different ways of actually putting the machine together. Um, oh, I'm still not going to get up there, am I? Heading over to the 1980s office, we've got lots more cool stuff. A Mattel Aquarius is showing off its parts as if it doesn't have a care in the world, and the Speccy 48K is showing off a version of the Micronet Tele software that allowed the day's computer users to log on to the Prestel network. This little corner here is all about hooking up to the great world outside your window, courtesy of Retrobytes John and the lovely people at Qtel, who revel in setting up old school telephony and internet services specifically for events like this. There's plenty of nice fins here, I can't help but get a kick out of a system called internet.tv for example. And of course there's an Amstrad emailer cause well why wouldn't there be? But yes, these systems are actually connected to networks and showing real data, it's not just smoke and mirrors. There's lots more cool fins. This Phoenix F256 setup is utterly thrashing the Amiga at its own party piece, displaying dozens of boing balls as opposed to just one. Then there's the awesome Quasar, the absolute destination for another computer that got dealt a poor hand, the Sam Coupe. Colin has been developing for the Sam for 30 years, he creates add-ons for it, he writes magazines for it, wonderful to see. You've also got the RC2014 here, a more modern homebrew Z80 machine, a pretty regular feature at these events and something that's always nice to see, always guaranteed for a good display. All this and more could be found in the 80s office and we'll be back in here later. 
Back in the main area, we have a stonking display of classic computing from Stephen, as well as Adrian from Binary Dinosaurs. There's the Tiki Data TK100, Norway's answer to the BBC Micro, and a machine that you are only really able to find in schools. Adrian's beautifully named Micro World Micro B, an Australian school computer, actually runs a pretty decent version of Joust. And there is another pretty special machine indeed, the original Next T computer, complete with flying toasters. It's normally known as that nice looking thing Steve Jobs did between his Apple stints, although it should probably be better known as the computer that Tim Berners-Lee developed the world's first web browser on. When you put these two exhibits together, you get a nice little educational corner of the Retrofest. Here we have a display from Roy Templeman. Lots of cool stuff here next to the Casios, including plenty of classic Specky and Specky related examples like your ZX80s and Jupiter Aces, but this thing here is naturally the eye catcher. This beastly blue machine that looks straight out of the TARDIS is a Kenback 1, and amazingly it dates all the way back to 1970. It's considered to be the world's first personal computer, and less than 50 of them were ever sold. This here is one of 14 in the world that are known to still exist. It's certainly not responsible for the displays on the tellies, the output you get is the row of lights on the top. It goes without saying that you do not see this in the flesh very often. Back in the 80s office, we've got some more cool stuff. A Whitechapel MG1, an IBM PC80 decked out with transputer processors, a very pleasant ZX81 inside the fuller case, and plenty more besides that. You can see the Cambridge Z88 and a few other very nice machines lurking around. Here's another special little section, belonging to a man named John Newcomb. If you're familiar with some of the early marketing for the ZX80 and ZX81, you might have seen adverts that claim the machines could run a power station, presumably a nuclear one, being the early 80s and all. This exhibits in tribute to that, a ZX81 with software that's mocked up to do just that. <laughs> Lovely stuff. You can also add a glorious Altair 8800 and one of the more stunning examples out there of the UK's NASCOM 2 computer kit, complete with serious industrial milling on the frontage. Lovely jubbly. A very fun and playful exhibit. Speaking of playful, it's always nice to see Simon and Anita from Chronosoft. They've been selling games for old computers for 20 years now, and a whole bunch of new titles were available here. Nice if you want something to play for your Specky, your Dragon 32, or even your Mattel Aquarius. Here we have the Carter Brothers showing off some of their wares. I love the classic look of their homebrew works, ones that they jokingly nickname Twits and have that real bashed out from the shed look about them. I believe that these homebrews originate from a kit called the New Bear 7768, another very early British design from the late 1970s, and there's a video playing of one of the Twits taking charge of a train set. Also of note here is the PID-P11, a modern replica of the PDP-1170, and one of the prettier early 80s micros out there, the Olivetti M20, a very nice and capable computer, but one that sadly couldn't stand up to the IBM PC and other similar machines. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Time for break off to the Devonshire. Yeah, absolutely, yes, yes, absolutely. Good. <laughs> I don't think I can manage another burger. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lovely. Back in the office, we've got a fun display of famed computers doing things that you might not expect them to be doing, as well as a great example of the Micro Professor MPFIP, a computer that dates back to 1981 and amazingly is still manufactured and sold to this day thanks to a British company named Flight Electronics. We also have some lovely stuff from 6502 Nerd, particularly his own homebrew 6502 computer, the Breadboard Computer, or BBC. This sort of passion project is, once again, another great reason to go to events like these, where you can see these labours of love with your own eyes. No retro festival would be quite complete without the folks from Bletchley Park, who naturally can call upon their archives to beat anyone out when it comes to sheer age. 
Under the big portrait of dynamite Hedy Lamarr, the National Museum exhibited some seriously old stuff, such as a Brunswiga mechanical calculator that dates all the way back to 1947. The remnants of grime and do not touch signs kinda speak for themselves, don't they? We also have a cool little game running here on the Commodore 16. This is a 2018 game called Digiloy, and the graphics are made entirely using Petski, the Commodore's character set. You probably wouldn't believe that to be the case if I hadn't told you. Also, mmm, demos. Demos are always good, whether they're the ones that we saw previously from the Falcon, or this game of lifestyle work right here. <laughs> Oh god, it's gonna bother me now. What's that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now we come to one of the most imposing and incredible systems of the show, the Quantel Paintbox DPB7001. You may well have seen this kicking around in people's videos in the past, RMC's taken a look at them, and the legendary retro gamer VX has helped to restore one. Indeed, this exact model, which was passed in 2016 to Dexter's Tech Lab and finally restored to work in order in 2021. This is the only known working example of this machine anywhere in the world, and it's a phenomenon. Made in 1981, it's a video graphics machine that cost a whopping £120,000 for TV studios at the time, and, jeez, it's impossible to imagine just what the machine felt like back then, really. It's a huge system, one where every function belongs to its own dedicated card, and needless to say, it attracted a lot of attention here. Seriously, just what an exhibit, and what a journey this particular model has been on, all the way to people finally being able to actually use it once more. 120 grand. Checking back in with Pete, here he's got a particularly lousy console cum computer, the Atari 2600 with CompuMate add-on, capable of such fascinating things as Magic Easel here. Fancy your hand at drawing a snowman, or a rather dreadful world map? Well, you can do it with this program. Yeah, not good, but definitely amusing. But back in the 1980s office, something quite wild is going on. Here we have Tim Gilberts and his collection of glorious kits. There's a lot of interesting stuff here, but the thing that takes the most cake is what he's done with the old MK14 microcomputer. Now if you're not fully aware, the MK14 is a very cheap kit, £40 in 1977 money, and it was sold by Science of Cambridge, the precursor to Sinclair Research. It can hold a whopping 640 bytes of onboard RAM, and it requires a VDU add-on to display anything at all. And yet, here it is. Not just with a nice picture of Uncle Sir Clive himself, but with a version of Space Invaders. Yes, Adrian of Binary Dinosaurs here is playing MK14 Invaders, a game that the MK14 actually predates by a year and has no business running. The fire and white are mapped to the same button due to the nature of the system, but it is still playable. This sort of thing is wonderful to see. You do tend to see many versions of the old invaders at events like this, and as I said earlier, that's something that makes you wonder if the scene's all about finding as many exotic ways of playing Space Invaders as there is possible, but doing it on an MK14? <laughs> that certainly takes the cake. It's things like this and people like this that make these events so awesome. Not just the knowledge, but the passion and the inspiration. All told, it made for a brilliant weekend. It's so great to hang out with these people and see just what they've got to offer. 
The atmosphere was unbearably lovely throughout, that's for sure. I would say that even if you don't necessarily think that blinking lights are prettier than the Sistine Chapel, if you're able to get to a computer museum, or if there's an old computer club kicking about, I would definitely have a look in there, because you will find so many wonders. I cannot recommend it enough. Hopefully you've enjoyed this look at the Retro Computer Festival, and as ever, I shall say, bye for now.